Okay, are we on? Yeah, okay. We're on. okay, are we on? Yeah, there we go. Thank you, Shalom. All right. All right, Shalom, everyone, and <laughs> welcome back to our school. Yeah, my name is Eric Allen, and uh, with me here is Mr. Kent Freeland, and we are talking about Shemini, the 8th, Leviticus chapter 9, verses... Okay, Jewish chapter 9, verse 1, 3, 11, 47. And sorry for the technical delays. And uh, shalom. Thank you, Father Yahweh, again for this Torah. And thank you for this Torah portion. And help us to understand your Torah. And help us to have the reasoning and understanding from your spirit as we read your Torah. In Yahshua's name, I ask, make it so. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. And Kadosh says, I am on. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we're talking about Leviticus chapter 9 through 11. So let's go back to where we were, because I don't know where we left off. And on the eighth day, it came to be Moshe called Aharon and his sons and the elders of Israel and said to Aharon, Take for yourself as a sin offering a bull, and as a burnt offering, a ram, a perfect one, and bring them before Yahweh. And speak to the children of Israel, saying, Take a male goat as a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both a year old, perfect ones as burnt offering, and a bull and a ram as peace offerings, to slaughter before Yahweh, and a grain offering mixed with oil, for today Yahweh shall appear to you. And they took what Moshe commanded before the tent of meeting, and all the congregation drew near and stood before Yahweh. But Moshe said, This is the word which Yahweh commanded you to do, so that the esteem of Yahweh appears to you. And Moshe said to Haran, Go to the altar and prepare your sin offering and your burnt offering and make atonement for yourself and for the people and make the offering of the people and make atonement for them as Yahweh has commanded. So Aharon came near to the altar and slaughtered the calf of the sin offering which was for himself and the sons of Aharon brought the blood to him, and he dipped his finger in the blood, and put it on the horns of the altar, and poured the blood at the base of the altar, and the fat, and the kidneys, and the appendage on the liver of the sin offering he burned on the altar, as Yahweh had commanded. As Yahweh had commanded Moshe. And the flesh and the skin he burned with fire outside the camp. And he slaughtered the burnt offering. And the sons of Aharon presented to him the blood which he sprinkled on the altar all around. And they presented the burnt offering to him with its pieces and head. And he burned them on the altar. And he washed the entrails and the legs and burned them with the burnt offering on the altar. And they brought the people's offering, and took the goat, which was the sin offering for the people, and slaughtered it, and made it a sin offering, like the first one. And he brought the burnt offering, and made it according to the right ruling. He also brought the grain offering, and filled his hand with it, and burned it on the altar, besides the burnt offering of the morning. And he slaughtered the bull and the ram as peace offerings, which were for the people. And Aharon's sons presented to him the blood which he sprinkled on the altar all around. And the fat from the bull and the ram, the fat tail and the covering, and the kidneys and the appendage on the liver, and they placed the fat on the breast and burned the fat on the altar. But the breast 
and the right thigh, Aharon waved as a wave offering before Yahweh, as Moshe had commanded. And Aharon then lifted up his hand toward the people and blessed them and came down from making the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Moshe and Aharon went into the tent of meeting and came out and blessed the people and the esteem of Yahweh appeared to the people and fire came out from before Yahweh and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar and all the people saw and cried aloud and fell on their faces. All right, any questions or comments so far? So we have exactly as said in Exodus 29, as it was said to be done, and now it has been done. The the set apart place has been put together. The tabernacle has been put together, and now they have anointed and ordained a heron exactly as we did last week. And now they waited eight days, and we just read what they just did. They they brought the offerings. They brought the sacrifices, and the esteem of Yahweh appeared to them as has been predicted so now chapter 10 and Nadav and Avihu the sons of Aharon each took his fire holder and put fire in it and put incense on it and brought strange fire before Yahweh which he had not commanded them and fire came out from Yahweh and consumed them and they died before Yahweh and Moshe said to Aaron, This is what Yahweh spoke, saying, By those who come near me, let me be set apart, and before all the people, let me be esteemed. And Aaron was silent. And Moshe called to Mishael and to Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come near, take your brothers from before the set-apart place out of the camp. So they came near and took them by their long shirts out of the camp, as Moshe had said. And Moshe said to Aaron and to Eleazar and to Ithamar his sons, Do not unbind your heads, nor tear your garments, lest you die, and wrath come upon all the people. But let your brothers... All the house of Israel bewail the burning which Yahweh has kindled, and do not go out from the door of the tent of meeting, lest you die, for the anointing oil of Yahweh is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moshe. So we have some questions here. First we have a strange fire before Yahweh, which he had not commanded them. But then we have Moshe saying that those who come into his presence are set apart. And we also have Moshe saying that the anointing oil is upon them. So they mix up the incense. There's much speculation whether they mix the incense incorrectly. It's almost a given that they came in at the wrong time. Is the attitude of their heart the reason why they were consumed? Is the anointing oil being upon them the reason why they are consumed? Were they consumed because they did wrong or were they consumed without doing any wrong many questions if we have any answers we can type them in now and you had some you had some questions you had some thoughts on that earlier mr kent well uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we had kind of processed was that the question of what were they doing you know did they do the right thing at the wrong time did they do the wrong thing at the right time or did they do the wrong thing at the wrong time and you know there is the question of of Moshe going to Aaron and and telling him these things of Yahweh's wishes to be set apart to be um, exemplified from the people to be esteemed and the fact that Aaron said nothing I don't there's the question mark of did he have this discussion with his sons did he make that clear 
things of that nature and he didn't speak for himself so that leaves an opening as to did they do this on their own or was it that um our own did not do a good job of going to them and making sure that they understood what was right what was wrong so there's a lot of open question there as to how this ended up the way it did and to amplify the prior the uh situation even more we have another time when someone was struck dead by yahweh coming into the presence of yahweh if we go now to second samuel chapter 6 verses 1 through 19 we will examine that all right second samuel chapter 6 verses 1 through 19 now david again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David rose up and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Yehuda to bring up the ark from, to bring up from there the ark of Elohim that is called by the name, the name, Yahweh of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. And they placed the ark of the Elohim, the ark of Elohim, on a new wagon. That's interesting. It's commanded to have the, the poles always in the ark and to be carried by by four sons of a heron, four Levites, as they are carrying it. But now they're putting it on a wagon, like the Philistines did. The Philistines put it on a wagon and it came back. But now they're putting it on a wagon. It's an interesting point. And they placed the ark of Elohim on a new wagon and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahu, Ayo, sons of Abinadab, were leading the new wagon. And they brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And the ark of Elohim, okay, and they brought it from the house of Abinadab, which is on the hill, with the ark of Elohim. And Ahio was walking before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel were dancing before Yahweh with instruments of fir wood and with lyres and with harps and with tambourines and sistrums and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nakan, Uziel reached out toward the ark of Elohim and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled, and the wrath of Yahweh burned against Azah and Elohim smote him there for the fault, and he died there by the ark of Elohim. And David was displeased because Yahweh had broken out against Azah, and he called the name of the place Peretz Azah until this day. And David was afraid of Yahweh on that day, and said, How shall the ark of Yahweh come to me? And David would not move the ark of Yahweh with him into the city of David, but David turned it aside to, into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of Yahweh remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And Yahweh blessed Obed-Edom and all his house. And it was reported to the sovereign David, saying, Yahweh has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all he has because of the ark of Elohim. David then went and brought up the ark of Elohim from the house of Obed Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And it came to be when those bearing the ark had gone six steps that he slaughtered bulls and fatted sheep. Now we have people bearing the ark on their shoulders as is commanded. And David danced before Yahweh with all his might. And David was wearing a linen shoulder garment. Thus David and the house of Israel brought up the ark of Yahweh was shouting and with the sound of a ram's horn and it came to be when the ark of Yahweh came into the city of Dawid that Michal daughter of Shaul looked through a window and saw Dawid the sovereign leaping and dancing before Yahweh and she despised him in her heart so they brought the ark of Yahweh in and set it, it and set it in its place in the midst of the tent that David had pitched for it, and David burnt offerings before Yahweh and peace offerings. And when David had finished bringing burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people 
in the name of Yahweh of hosts, and he apportioned to all the people, to all the crowd of Israel, from man even to women, to each one a loaf of bread and a measure and cake of raisins, and all the people left each one to his house. So we see the, the wrath of Yahweh burned against as the offer uh, reaching out and touching the ark. And that's interesting. Now, is it because Yahweh wanted to bless the house of Rabad Edom and that's where the ark wanted to fall? Or when the ark stumbled, was the when the wagon, when the oxen stumbled, was the wagon going to collapse and was the ark going to fall there or was it going to continue without the help? But we see again where the wrath of Yahweh, this time it is clearly stated that the wrath of Yahweh burned against them. In the first, in the first instance here in Leviticus chapter 10, we don't have it saying that the wrath burned against them, but we did say fire came out and consumed them. So we have questions. If anyone has any thoughts or insight on that, we can type them into the uh, chat room. If not, then... Well, can't. the interesting part also was that uh, when they went back and brought the Ark the second time, yes, they did the things right, but um, the celebration that was taking place was not something that normally happened. And some of the things of the celebration obviously offended McCall, the way David was um, acting, yet um, clearly it didn't offend Yah because he did nothing about it. So it, it we have to look at are the ordinances of Yah being followed and when they're being followed there doesn't seem to be this problem but when they're not being followed um, men are taking a chance. They have the possibility of Yah's um, anger being kindled and, and something happening. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, that's insightful. Any other questions or comments? Okay. <laughs> so, picking up here in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 8, we have an other possibility, which we did not consider yet. We considered that they possibly brought the, they mixed the incense wrong. We brought They possibly brought it at a wrong time. So we have a possibility of a judgment call. But now we're introducing one more element into the equation. Leviticus chapter 10 verse 8. And Yahweh spoke to Aharon saying, Do not drink wine or strong drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tent of meeting, lest you die. A law forever throughout your generations. So as to make a distinction between the set apart and the profane, and between the unclean and the clean, and to teach the children of Israel all the laws which Yahweh has spoken to them by the hand of Moshe. And Moshe spoke to Aharon and Eleazar and Ithamar, his sons who were left, take the grain offering that is left over from the offerings made by fire to Yahweh, and eat it without leaven besides the altar, for it is most set apart, and you shall eat it in a set apart place, because it is yours by law, and your sons by law of the offering made by fire to Yahweh for so I have been commanded so it's possible that Nadab and Abihu were having a little bit too much wine which caused the error in judgment but also we just read that they were that the remaining sons were commanded to take this offering and eat it the way they are commanded to be eating it now in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 14, And the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of the contribution you eat in a clean place, you and your sons and your daughters with you, for they are yours by law and your sons by law, which are given from the slaughterings of the peace offerings of the children of Israel, the thigh of the contribution and the breast of the wave offering they bring with the offerings of fat made by fire to bring a wave offering before Yahweh, and it shall be yours and your sons with you by law forever as Yahweh has commanded. And Moshe diligently looked for the goat of the sin offering and saw it was burned up. 
And he was wroth with Eleazar and Ithamar, the sons of Aharon, who were left, saying, Why have you not eaten the sin offering in a set-apart place, since it is most set-apart, and Elohim has given it to you to bear the crookedness of the congregation, to make atonement for them before Yahweh? See, its blood was not brought out inside the set-apart place. You should have eaten it without fail in a set-apart place, as I have commanded. And Aharon said to Moshe, See, today they have brought their sin offering and their burnt offering before Yahweh, and matters like these have come to me. If I had eaten the sin offering today, would it have been right in the eyes of Yahweh? And, Moshe, and when Moshe heard that, it was good in his eyes. Okay. But they did not get consumed for not eating the sin offering. Now we have, as we mentioned in weeks before, a pause in the narration of what's going on, and Yahweh is going to spend the next four chapters, or five, he just got said, you do not drink wine or strong drink when you come into the tent of meeting so you can teach what is clean and what is unclean. Now, we're going to look at what is clean and what is unclean. We're going to begin that with chapter 11. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe and Aharon, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the living creatures which you do eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatever has a split hoof completely divided, chewing the cud among the beasts, that you do eat. Only these you do not eat among those that chew the cud or those that have a split hoof. The camel, because it chews the cud but does not have a split hoof, it is unclean to you. And the rabbit, because it chews the cud but does not have a split hoof, it is unclean to you. Interesting note here that on, in verse 5, in the, in the ISR version of the scriptures, it says rabbit. In many others, it has coney. And some would have other versions. Of, and when you look the words up, you see hyrax as a, and, and uh, rock badger as possible explanations. Uh, even going into uh, the ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible for a clear picture of what this is says that this animal is not known. In Hebrew it's known as Shaphan and even the, like I said, even the uh, ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible doesn't have a clear definition of what this animal is but don't eat it, whatever it is. And <laughs> continuing on and the hair, because it chews the cud, but does not have a split hoof, it is unclean to you. And some say that that animal is not unknown either what it is. But, uh, and the pig, though it has a split hoof completely divided, yet does not chew the cud, it is unclean to you. We know what the pig is. But interesting, the pig has an outward appearance with the split hoof of a clean animal but when you observe its behavior it doesn't behave it doesn't chew the cud as all the clean animals are supposed to so when you observe the behavior of the pig it doesn't match up even though it has the outward appearance and that's also a shadow picture of how some people are they can have the outward appearance of righteousness but when you watch their behavior by their fruits you will know them and they will not be what they appear to be we have a wolf in sheep clothing so to speak but, anyway, and the pig, though it has a split hoof completely divided, yet does not chew the cud, it is unclean to you. Their flesh you do not eat, and their carcasses you do not touch, and they are unclean to you. These you do eat of all that are in the waters, Anyone that has fins and scales in the waters, in the seas, or in the rivers, that you do eat. But all that do not have fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers, all that move in the waters, or any living creature which is in the waters, they are an abomination to you. They are an abomination to you. Of their flesh you do not eat, 
and their carcasses you abominate. And the, now, I don't know if it's possible. There's a product out on the market today which is which has a question. It's controversial and I'm not seeing these questions because I'm not in the right place on the chat window which isn't scrolling with me. Alright, see here. What do we got here? We got a comment, okay? Ramskins dyed red, sea cows. Acacia, and for some reason I'm not even able to see this. Yeah. Let me help. Okay, you can read it for me, because <laughs> I can't see it. Um, it's not... Looks like it's quoting a verse for a uh, comment, but I can't read it. Yeah, you can read it if you want. Here. Um, you me off Ramskins dyed red, sea cow highs, acacia wood, AKGV, and ramskins dyed red, and badger skins, tim wood, ASB, and ramskins dyed red, and seal skins. Um, these are related to the animals you were asking about. It is compare all of the translations used in Eastward. So they're talking about the animals oh. you were discussing. Oh, the animals for the burnt offering and the sin offering. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Nice to see you back on. Nice to see everything's back going well for you again. You had some interesting situations going on with your life, and now you've got it's reverted, and I'm glad to see you back. And uh, still trying to type in here. Um, talk oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. <clears throat> okay. And... Uh, So they are an abomination to you. You don't eat them. And what we were talking about earlier, as far as getting the, uh, there's a product out there. We have... Dugong skins. Dugong skins. Dugong skins. Okay. Uh, what I was going to go with next, as an example of uh, their carcasses you abominate. I suppose it's possible to get hair off of a pig while it is still alive. There would not be a carcass because the animal is still alive. And we know that we can use camel hair for skin. Ha camel skin and camel hair for clothing. As as John the Baptist was wearing camel. But um, we have hairbrushes made with, with, pigs, with pig's hair. Now, I've been asked about this before, so I'm answering that, for, which specifically I was asked about. And... The way I see it, I don't think we're getting the hair from the pig from the pig while it's still alive. So we're touching the carcass to get the pig's hair. So I would say that is an abomination as well. And I would abominate the carcass of the pig and not take the hair from the dead pig and use it on a hairbrush. Or on a even worse, they use that also on a grill brush, which you touch and put into the butter that you're eating and brush onto your grill that you're cooking on. And we'll get into later what happens if the unclean matter touches the grill. Let's see, what is it, Dungan? It's a large marine mammal which, together with the manatees, is one of four living species of the order of Serenia. It is the only living, and then when, I think he ran out of curse, or. Okay, <laughs> all right. Well, we'll wait for that comment to come completely through before we, oh, before we discuss it. And here it comes. How many of our Bible scriptures have a pigskin cover? How many of our Bible skins have a pigskin cover? That was brought up also in discussion online. <laughs> that would be uh, interesting. Their carcasses you abominate. So that's a question you must answer for yourself. Um. It was recently mentioned that genuine leather equals pigskin. I think genuine leather is cowhide, but you are correct very much, Scott Martin, that pigskin is used quite often. And it's something we have to be discerning, as with gelatin, as with uh, other products which are made from pig's feet and, and from pig's fat. We need to be very careful and discerning in the ingredients lists of the food that we're eating. 
and also I suppose of the leather. The uh, mink is not specifically mentioned as something we're not to wear, and the camel is not specifically mentioned as something we're not to wear, but the pig is. So we have two types of leather that we can wear, which are unclean animals which we don't eat, but the carcass of the pig we abominate. <laughs> so that's going to be difficult to do at times, and we have to be very discerning. Okay, but all that do not have fins and scales in the seas and rivers, all that move in the waters, or any living creature which is in the waters, they are an abomination to you. They are an abomination to you. Of their flesh you do not eat, and their carcasses you abominate. All that have not fins or scales in the waters is an abomination to you. And these you do abominate among the birds. They are not eaten. They are an abomination, the eagle, the vulture, and the black vulture, and the hawk, and the falcon after its kind, and every raven after its kind, and the ostrich, and the nighthawk, and the seagull, and the hawk after its kind, and the little owl, and the fisher owl, and the great owl, and the white owl, and the pelican, and the caran vulture, and the stork and the heron after its kind, and the hopi and the bat. It's interesting, it says the stork and the heron after its kind. We know that the stork has webbed feet, and the heron has a flat bill. The duck has a black, flat bill, and the duck has webbed feet. So we can say the stork and the heron after its kind. We can connect the dots any way we want to on those. I'm not going to say right or wrong on that. It's a gray area, but I will not eat it. All right, continuing on, verse 11, all flying insects that creep on all fours is an abomination to you. Only these you eat of every flying insect that creeps on all fours. Those which have jointed legs above their feet with which to leap on the earth, these of them you do eat, the locust after its kind and the destroying locust after its kind and the cricket after its kind, and the grasshopper after its kind. But all other flying insects which have four feet, it is an abomination to you. And by these you are made unclean. Anyone touching the carcass of any of them is unclean until evening, and anyone picking up the carcass of them has to wash his garments and shall be unclean until evening. And the beast that has a split hoof not completely divided or does not chew the cud is unclean to you. Anyone touch, who touches their carcass is unclean. And whatever goes on its paws among the creatures that go on all fours, these are unclean to you. Anyone who touches their carcass is unclean until evening. And he who picks up their carcass has to wash his garments and shall be unclean until evening. They are unclean to you, and these are unclean to you among the creeping creatures that creep on the earth, the mole, and the mouse, and the tortoise after its kind, and the gecko, and the land crocodile, and the sand reptile, and the sand lizard, and the chameleon. These are unclean to you among all that creep. Anyone who touches them when they are dead becomes unclean until evening. And whatever any of them in its dead state falls upon becomes unclean. Whether it is a wooden object or a garment or skin or sack or any object which work is done, it is put in water and it shall be unclean until evening. Then it shall be clean. Any earthen vessel into which any of them falls, whatever is in it becomes unclean, and you break it. So there, if if we had a a wooden bowl or a ceramic bowl with the, uh, with the unclean brush, and when the unclean t brush touches it, the earthen vessel would be completely broken and destroyed when the unclean brush touched it, or if an insect fell into it, or if, I don't see how a <laughs> anything else could touch a 
touch a bowl like that and touch a vessel, but when something unclean touches the vessel, the vessel is completely destroyed. And whatever the carcass falls become clean, unclean, an oven or a range, it is broken down. They are unclean and unclean to you. But a fountain or a well... Okay, I'm just skipped a verse. Verse 34, and any of the food which might be eaten on which water comes becomes unclean, and any drink which might be drunk from it becomes unclean, and on whatever the carcass falls becomes unclean, an oven or a cooking range, it is broken down, they are unclean and are unclean to you. But a fountain or a well, a collection of water is, is clean, but whatever touches their carcass is unclean, and when any of their carcass falls on any planting seed which is to be sown, it is clean. But when any water is put on the seed, and any part of the seed, and any part of such carcass falls on it, then it is unclean to you. And when any of the beasts which are yours for food dies, he who touches its carcass becomes unclean until evening. And he who eats of his carcass has to wash his garments and shall be unclean until evening. And he who picks up his carcass has to wash his garments and shall be unclean until evening. And every creeping creature that creeps on the earth is an abomination. It is not eaten. Whatever crawls on its stomach and whatever grows on all fours and whatever has many feet among all creeping creatures that creep on the earth these you do not eat, for they are an abomination. Do not make yourselves abominable with any creeping creature that creeps, and do not make yourselves unclean with them, lest you be defiled by them. For I am Yahweh your Elohim, and you shall set yourselves apart, and you shall be set apart, for I am set apart, and do not defile yourselves with any creeping creature that creeps on the earth, for I am Yahweh, who is bringing you up out of the land of Mitzrayim to be your Elohim, and you shall be set apart, for I am set apart. We will mention that Kepha, or Peter, Shimon, if you will, quotes this in his letter, and we can read that in First, first Peter in your Bibles, 1, Chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, we'll read the exact same thing I just read there, and it's quoted, as and he says, as it's been written. And here is where it's been written, so he must be referring to this entire passage when he's quoting that. And also, Yahshua quotes that in, in Matthew chapter 5, and we'll read that later. Marlena has a question. And Ever wonder why Yahweh tells us that, tells us what animals to not because they do not chew the cud or are an abomination but doesn't give us any other reason why not to eat nor to touch them I often wonder that <laughs> that's a good question there are many possibilities it could be be you set apart as I am set apart it could be just because, to mark us as a set apart people we know that Yahweh loves us and we know that Yahweh has good intentions toward us so as you would tell your child don't go play in the street I see that as him saying don't eat this and he's marked them clearly as the ones that chew the cud and the ones that have hooves that split a completely split hoof are okay but anything else the one that walks on paws or he's marked the insects that have the uh, hinge leg and he's marked the fish with the uh, fins and scales but anything else it hasn't ha that doesn't have his mark on it is created for another purpose and not for food. And if you eat these, then you're going to go beyond what he has ordained for you as food. Just as if a child going into the street is going into a dangerous area, I see these as being a dangerous area as being unhealthy. It's possible that they're not unhealthy. And there are things we don't understand, but it said we do know that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that flows out of the mouth of Yahweh. And these are the words that flowed out of his mouth, and we know that he loves us, and we know that he knows everything. It's a well, I would also point out some of the animals, or a lot of what he's chose, has very select diets, and the ones that he did not chose, or did not choose, eat just about anything. So, in a way. <laughs> 
he's telling us to be like the things that we're consuming because we should have a select diet and we shouldn't just <laughs> allow ourselves to just eat anything. That works for most for most cases, but then people are going to say, "What about the goat? What about the carp?" Oh, I'm not saying all of them. Yeah, I'm just saying for, <laughs> yeah, it works for, for it a, works for, for a list. Yeah. It, 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 you know. It does work very much for most cases, but there are exceptions. Yeah, there's, and, and, there's some and there's exceptions to the cholesterol rule, and there's exceptions to the trichinitis rule. We have cholesterol and trichinitis rampant throughout the pig. Right. But what do we have in the squirrel? What do we have in the rattlesnake? There's, as far as our understanding is concerned, there's nothing unhealthy in them. But as far as our understanding of our Heavenly Father, who loves us and knows everything, we ours is not to reason why, ours is just to do or die. Yeah. <laughs> I heard that the pigs are to use for cleaning up earth, such as things that we can't get rid of, um, also as the bottom feeder fish. There is a halal shop within a couple of blocks of us that sells camel meat. Islam evidently believes that camel's two toes are the same as cloven hoof. Wow, that's interesting. I didn't know. I, didn't know I did not realize that Islam believes that, but we have right here the word of Yahweh saying that it's not that way. Wow, that's, in, that's thank you, Scott. That's a very good point. <laughs> thank you, uh, Maria, for your questions as well. I hope I've answered them. If not, rephrase your question so I can rephrase my answer, because <laughs> I would love for us to have an understanding of that. All right, there's two more verses here. Then we're going to get also into other arguments against this. All right, for the Torah, all right, for the for this is the Torah of the beasts and the birds of every living creature that moves in the waters and of every creature that creeps on the earth, to make distinction between the unclean and the clean, and between the living creature that is eaten and the living creature that is not eaten. All right, that concludes that. And also online, we had a couple of discussions about, uh, we had the, we already addressed the issue that Scott Martin brought up, thank you, with the, uh, with the pig skin being used as a binding for the, for the word. That question and argument was brought up. And also, Acts chapter 10 was brought up. I will say, in Acts chapter 10, we have a vision, and visions are not necessarily always to be taken literally. In chapter Acts chapter 10, verse 14, we have Kepha arguing in this vision that he has never eaten any of these. Now, this is 10, maybe 15 years after the death and resurrection of Yahshua. And he still has never done this, so it's obvious that Yahshua has not taught that it's okay. And some say that he, and some say that he has. In Matthew chapter five, we're going to get into that. But Yahshua also in Matthew chapter five be, said, "Be ye holy, as I am holy. Be ye set apart, as I am set apart." Um, in Mark chapter seven, we have an argument about the uh, where Yahshua says, "What goes into your mouth does not make you defiled." So you're not going to be an evil, uh, demon-possessed person for what goes into your mouth, but what comes out of your mouth comes in. What comes out of your mouth makes you defiled. So if you have a bad heart and you have a bad eye, and you're an already a greedy or stingy person, then you're going to be speaking things that are not right. You're going to be condemning other people, just like the Pharisees were condemning people for not washing their hands. That condemnation coming out of their mouth is worse than anything going into your mouth, but the entire issue is discussing what goes with unwashed hands. And uh, I would point out, <clears throat> if you go back to Nadav and Abihu, they did something, according to what Moshe told Aaron, that did not esteem him, did not set him apart. And then he talks about the drinking, and then he talks about the clean food, He's going through a process of teaching how to be set apart. Ah, that's true. That's just we just read. You could be like anybody and eat all the food that's available, or you can be set apart 
which gives you the ability to go before Yahweh without being consumed because you're unclean. You're not following the requests. Ooh, that could be why uh, Moshe was so upset that the two sons that remained didn't follow did the rules not either. Follow the rules. So why have you not eaten this goat? I've been commanded that you must eat this goat. And then we start learning about what to eat. Now the question <laughs> is, had they eaten something else, and that's why they weren't hungry to eat the goat? That's that's, that's interesting. All right, I mentioned chapter uh, Matthew chapter five, and you see in Acts chapter ten, if this law has was to be changed, it could have been changed as. We will read here in Matthew chapter 5 all the other laws that were changed. If you want to read Matthew chapter 5 starting in verse 21 through 48, okay. we will see what has been changed. You heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that whoever is worth, whoever is wroth with his brother without a cause shall be liable to judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Racha, shall be liable to the Sanhedrin. But whoever says, You fool, shall be liable to fire of Ganah. If then you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother holds whatever against you, leave your gift before the altar, and go, first make peace with your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Be well-minded with your opponent promptly while you are on the way with him, lest your op opponent deliver you to the judge, and the judge to the officer, and you to be thrown into the prison. Truly, I say to you, you shall by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. You heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone looking at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And if you are right, if your right eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it away from you. For it is better for you that one of your members perish than for your entire body to be thrown into Gehenna. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, Cut it off and throw it away from you. For it is better for you that one of your members perish, that your entire body be thrown into Gehenna. And it has been said, whoever puts away his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that whoever puts away his wife, except for the matter of whoring, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who has been put away commits adultery. Again, you heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to Yah. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, because it is Elohim's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Yerushalayim, for it is the city of the great sovereign. Nor swear by your head, because you are not able to make one hair white or black. But let your word, yea, be yea, and your no be no. And what goes beyond these is from the wicked one. You heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the wicked. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. And he who wishes to sue you and take away your inner garment, let him have your outer garment as well. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and from him who wishes to borrow from you, do not turn away. You heard it, you heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those cursing you, do good to those hating you, and pray for those insulting you and persecuting you, 
so that you become sons of the Father in in the heavens, because he makes his sun rise on the wicked and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those loving you, what reward have you? Are the tax collectors not doing the same too? And if you greet your brother only, what do you do more than others? Are the tax collectors not doing so too? Therefore be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. So we have Yahshua quoting again, or rephrasing basically. He says, be ye set apart as I am set apart. In Leviticus chapter 11 verse 45. And now he says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. He says, and earlier we didn't read that. But he says, all the Pharisees say to do, guard and do. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you will not see the kingdom. And he also says, I have not come to do away with the Torah. And he says, not one, not the least stroke of a pen or the, uh, or the smallest letter of Torah will be changed. Until all is fulfilled. And do you see peace on earth? Do we see the kingdom established? So we know that all is not established. We know all is not fulfilled. So all prophecy has not been fulfilled. And uh, oh, thank you, Mr. Kent. I forgot to put myself back on. But anyway. <laughs> uh, so Yahshua said to be perfect as he is. The Father in heaven is perfect. And not one daughter or tittle. Especially not this tittle. Pardon the pun. Well, we uh, done away with Torah. Well, passed from the Torah, and um, so that's all we have for you today. And if you're having, uh, oh yeah, hi Richard. Thank you for joining us, and shalom. And uh, we will be on the uh, on the YouTube channel for that which. We missed. Thank you for joining us for late. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, we can type them in now. Or if not, we will conclude this session of Torah School. Until next week. And uh, hallelujah. Thank you, Father Yahweh, for your Torah. And thank you for allowing us to read your Torah. And thank you for your wisdom and sharing your wisdom with us. And giving us these instructions for life. For the life that you would have us to live. We have to be lived by your words. And that we exalt your name in all that we do. May your kingdom come shortly. May your kingdom come quickly. And may we be acting towards your kingdom as we go about our business this week. May we stay kingdom focused and help bring people into your kingdom. And help people to learn of your love and of your ways. In Yahshua's name we ask. Make it so. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, so thank you for joining us, and shalom.